Hey, thanks for joining me. I'm Chris Muir from the Oracle Mobile Platform team. Today we're going to get down and dirty with RAML, a language we use to describe RESTful APIs and is a perfect fit for defining the interfaces of Oracle Mobile Cloud Service custom APIs. Alrighty, let me start out by saying in this video that I like RAML. RAML gets the official double Chris Muir thumbs up. <laughs> If you've ever had to deal with WSDL documents for SOAP, you'll understand that RAML is to REST web services that WSDL is to SOAP web services. RAML's purpose is to help design and describe what services your REST APIs provide. But where WSDL suffer from XML hell, RAML takes a human-friendly approach to defining APIs that is actually quite refreshing to work with. Now, to give a more formal definition, Wikipedia states RESTful API modeling language, that is RAML, is a YAML-based language for describing RESTful APIs. Of specific importance in showing its value, RAML also encourages reuse, enables discovery and pattern sharing, and aims for merit-based emergence of best practices. Now, that sounds pretty good to me. Now, there are quite a few websites describing RAML's benefits and history out there, but let's kick on with describing what RAML actually captures, and then we'll show a basic RAML file so you'll see its benefits firsthand. All right, so let's think about what you want to do when designing and documenting a set of REST endpoints and therefore what you want to capture in RAML. Now, as you remember, the core elements of REST APIs are, firstly, its resources, such as its URIs, paths, and parameters. And then it's HTTP methods, get, put, post, delete, head, and potential content types such as JSON, XML, GIFs, PNG, and so on. In addition, the HTTP headers and payloads are the requests and responses, and oh, we shouldn't forget status codes too. Um, oh, an example payloads would be nice to include, and of course documentation would help everyone as well. So you get a general idea of all the different things that we need to capture. So next, to use a real example, let's imagine a system providing a RESTful API or interface for tracking presentations, say, at Oracle's yearly Oracle Open World Conference in San Francisco. So each presentation has a unique code, along with a set of data describing the presentation, such as its title and the speaker, I guess. Now the RESTful API allows the presentations to be retrieved, created, and so on. So how do we capture this set of requirements in a RAML file? Well, the best approach is to dive in and have a look at a RAML file and build it out based on the Oracle Open World example. Okay, so here we have our first RAML file, and the first set of lines you'll see in a RAML file are these two. So these entries are referred to as the root of the RAML file and apply to the rest of the API. In considering the um, rootness of these elements, I'm not sure I should be saying that in some countries, but in considering these root elements, note how they are not indented at all. Now this indentation is important to RAML files and we'll talk about more of this in a second. Now as you can see, the first line defines the version of the RAML document and must be the first line in the document. And RAML currently sits at version 0.8. Now the remaining lines are key value pairs separated by column, such as the title Oracle Open World Conference API. Now note, no quotes are used around the values in the key value pairs either. Okay, in terms of the root elements, the items may appear in any order. The only mandatory item is the title and all the other elements are optional. Now the base URI is one of the most important root elements. And this describes the relative path to the remaining resources listed in the RAML file. When we start building out our RESTful APIs, we simply may not know that the server address will be. so. During the development, the base URI is optional, but it is required in the final product, as we can see here, http oracle.com slash API slash open world. Now, a little caveat for MCS developers is that MCS will control the base URI for you. However, the purposes of teaching RAML, we'll keep with a standard RAML base URI going forward for demonstration purposes. Okay, another optional element in the root of the RAML file is the media type element, which as you can see in this example, the default media type is specified as application JSON. And this applies to all the resources that we're about to define. And this is both for the accepted or interred payloads on the request and responses. In addition, by the protocols entry, you can define which protocols the API may support, such as HTTP or HTTPS. However, again, a little MCS uh, caveat here is MCS converts HTTP calls to HTTPS regardless to enforce secure transmission so we can ensure the security of our communications between our mobile apps and MCS. Once you're comfortable defining your root elements, then you can define the individual resources of your APIs. For example, as we can see here, note the two resources, presentations and speakers, and their indented children, display name and description. Now, the RAML spec based on YAML says that the child elements need to be indented under their parent element. 
and if there are multiple children to the parent, all of them must be indented to the same position. Though it's optional if you choose to use tabs or spaces, though you should be consistent across the RAML document. Now, as you'll likely guess here, the display name and description elements are optional, though they add valuable documentation to help describe the REST APIs. It's your choice to include them or not, it's up to you. Great, so I think we're getting a bit of a feel how to define resources in our RAML file. Now let's dig a little deeper and consider how we define the HP methods of those resources. For now, let's focus just on the presentation's resource to keep this example simple, so we'll wind it back a little bit, and now we extend that presentation's resource so we can further explain RAML. So here, for the presentation's resource, I've added as a child the HTTP get method, and as a child to that, an optional description. Now again, notice the indentation here. As such, with the resources and the HTTP get method, this only defines that a HTTP get to the parent base URI, which is oracle.com forward slash API open world, and then the extended resource here, presentations forward slash presentations. And when we get from this URI, it will return a list of presentations. Hmm, now hang on, what format will that list be in? Now don't forget earlier, we defined the default media type as application JSON for all of the RAML file. So that applies to this specific resource as a global default here too, though we could override it if we chose to. Now this is going to be fine for getting a list of all the presentations say, but what if we want to just access the details about one presentation by its unique code? So in this case, we can extend the example. And as you can see now, our URI path includes at the top level presentations, and now at the second level, a resource based on a variable code delineated by curly braces. By creating this second level resource, we've essentially set up a nested resource. And then we can optionally go on to describe the code parameter in this nested path by using the URI parameters element, then defining the parameter name, and following that optional elements such as the display name, description, type, and so on. Now that's all good and well, you probably agree, but maybe we don't want to define the parameters as a nested resource, but rather we want to use URL query parameters instead. Something like forward slash presentations, question mark, code equals CCM1234. So here we drop the sub resource and instead under the get element, we use the query parameters element, defining our element name code, and then the optional elements to describe the query parameter. Next, let's now dig into considering the payload, specifically looking at responses and their status codes. Now going forward to make this example easier to work with yet again, we're going to drop back to this simpler example that you can see here. So say we wanted to document the different HTTP status code responses, specifically maybe a 200 and a 404, as well as what the, beta, uh, the body payloads might look like. How do we do this? Well, under a new responses element here, we can see two potential responses from our REST API. Firstly, a 200 success code, that will contain as part of the response body payload a valid application JSON document. Now, RAML allows us to provide an example using the example element, and along with the pipe symbol here to continue that example onto the next line. And you can see a potential JSON document with the presentation code and title. We can list out further responses, including an error code of 404 with an informational description of what went wrong. In this case, we'd use this error to say, well, the requested presentation code was not found. Okay, now that we've seen how to specify different responses, let's again whittle back the example and focus on a few more options. Imagine as part of your response, besides the payload described in the presentation that was queried, we had to also return as a HTTP header some internal identifier from the server, such as, I don't know, I'm going to make it up, but a unique query ID. So in the next round trip, the mobile client can on-supply this query ID so the server can track the line of queries a mobile user makes. So in this example here, you can see we've included under the 200 response not just the body from the previous example, but a headers element with the name of the actual header trackback query ID. So this allows us to find any custom HTTP headers returned as part of the response along with its characteristics. Okay, you're keeping up with us here? Let's again strip back the example and look at another feature called schemas, which allows us to find and validate the format of our payloads against the schema. So what I've done here is rather than just supplying an example payload, we've now defined a JSON schema to say exactly what the payload should contain. Now we're admittedly starting to go down a bit of a rabbit hole here, and I don't really want to have to describe the whole JSON schema syntax, as it's nicely covered at the website jsonschema.org. 
But briefly, in this example, you can see that we're using the JSON schema spec to define a JSON object with properties, code, and title. As this is a simple JSON schema doc, I've only included a description and type for each, but the JSON schema spec allows you to go into much more detail for each element, and you can learn that from the website. Note how I've concluded with the required property to say that both the code and title properties are mandatory. Hmm, now, thinking about schemas and the return payloads as an example, as we saw here, it is conceivable across many REST endpoints that we return multiple payloads really based on the same schema. As such, this is where one of Rebel's design goals come into play, specifically its ability to build in reuse. Rather than defining the schema again and again and again across the Remel document and all the endpoints, we can define one or more schemas in the root of the Remel document as follows. So as you can see here, we named the schema presentation in the root under the schemas element, then we refer to it by name by the schema element in the actual endpoint. So now if we have other endpoints or resources that use the same schema, we can just refer to it by name. Now this level of use is quite deliberate in Remel, as when you start working with defining resources and methods, you will find a lot of repetitive declarations across your endpoints. Now like in any programming language, you don't want to duplicate code which requires fixes in multiple places when you find a mistake. You really just want to define the code once, fix it once, and then reference it in multiple places. So ideally we want to make as much use of reuse as possible, and Remel provides more reusable features out of the box too. So again, if we whittle back to this simple example, where we define a resource presentations. Now you can imagine we might provide several paths for retrieve presentations, such as forward slash Monday, slash presentation, slash CCM1234, and alternatively slash speaker, slash Chris Muir, slash presentations, slash CCM1234, and so on and so forth. So ideally, it would be good just to template the presentation resource. And we do this through something called a resource type, which is also defined at the root level. Now, as you can see here, I've effectively uplifted the, the definition of the presentations resource to a resource type called presentations type. Then in the original resource, I refer to it by name through the type property. Now, there is a little bit of a problem with the resource type templating mechanism, as it works at a very large granular level of resources in our RAML file. Is there a finer grade and level of reuse we can make use of? Again, if we whittle back, step back to this simpler example, it might be we just want to template part of the method definition, not the whole resource. So in this example, we might want to make the query parameter code a template in itself. In this case, we change the code as follows to make use of something called traits. So here we define a trait called presentation code trait and lifted the query parameter properties to the root level of the RAML document. Then, within the get method of the presentations resource, we use the is keyword, followed by one or more traits we want to use. Okay, one final thing I wanted to cover off with you today is in these examples we've looked at defining resources so far, we've mostly looked at get methods. Well, what about an example like put or post, where the request carries a payload in the body as opposed to the response? In fact, you've already seen or been given all the pieces of the puzzle to do this yourself, but let's just run through an example to make sure you've got the full picture. So with our Oracle Open World Conferences API in mind, potentially we want to give the API caller the ability to create a new presentation through the presentations resource. So first of all, we extend our example to include a post method under the presentations resource. And again, for simplicity's sake, I'll just hide the get method so it's not making the example harder to read. And then say in our body payload for the post, we want to support an application JSON content type, we add the body property, the type and schema element, like we saw earlier, voila, we're done. As simple as that. And there you go. Once you know the basic building blocks of RAML files, and thanks to its very readable nature and its simple constructs, it, you must agree it's pretty easy to build out a working, easily understood example. Thanks for joining us. Hope you join us in those next episodes for Mobile Cloud Service very soon.